Coming up on DTNS, you hear a lot about the effects of the virus, but what about what people are doing to stop it? We've got a roundup of hackathons, open source projects, 3D printing efforts, and more to help the fight against COVID-19. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, March 25th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. 90 Aftershocks later, I'm Scott Johnson in Salt Lake City. Uh, and I'm the show's producer, Roger Jane. So the earthquakes have finally stopped in Utah. Uh, we're still having aftershocks, but really? they're small, mostly wow. small. They had one yesterday people could feel. Um, I haven't felt any since last Thursday, I guess. But downtown, it's apparently, it's a little nerve-wracking. But it yeah, does. I imagine this so. All, this all seems normal, I guess. Like, all the experts are like, no, that's how it trickles down. And you yeah, it, stop having them. So. Trust us out here in California. They're yeah, right. You guys know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we were talking about uh, a wonderland of life hacks on Good Day Internet. Got to get that show, uh, support the show, and become a listener of Good Day Internet at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Google's redesigned podcast app is now available to all on Android with three tabs, home for your feeds, explore to find new shows, and activity, which shows your listening habits. Google also launched its podcast app for iOS, and activity will sync across both platforms. Very handy. Yep, very good news there. Workers have tested positive for COVID-19 at nine Amazon warehouses, including distribution facilities near Oklahoma City, Louisville, Houston, Jacksonville, and Detroit, and facilities on Staten Island, New York. Wallingford, Connecticut, and Moreno Valley, California, east of Los Angeles. Amazon employs 750,000 people in the U.S. Amazon says it has increased sanitation efforts, limited to our uh, face-to-face meetings and staggered break times to promote social distancing. Yeah, we had some tips on uh, how to deal with packages in this time on Good Day Internet as well. Samsung shipped the first million 10 nanometer grade DDR4 DRAM modules based on an extreme ultraviolet process. Ultraviolet, not ultraviolent. The technique improves scaling to give better RAM performance, shorter development time, and better yields. Mass production of ultraviolet made RAM is expected sometime in 2021. Microsoft announced it's pausing all optional non-security updates for Windows and server products starting in May, which means C&D updates that usually arrive in the third and fourth week of a month. Google paused non-security updates to Chrome last week, we talked about it, and it will skip version 82 of Chrome as well. Microsoft is also delaying the scheduled end of service date for the Enterprise Education and IoT Enterprise editions of Windows 10 from April 14th all the way out to October 13th. Those devices will receive security updates for the next few months. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, a lot of these headlines swinging around about ad declines and how that's affecting some of the big tech companies. Well, as businesses shut down worldwide, many of them, uh, ad spending is declining. And Cohen and Company analysts estimate Google net revenue will be $127.5 billion for the year, $28.6 billion less than previous estimates. Facebook is now estimated to make $67.8 billion on the year. 15.7 billion less than previously estimated. Both companies are still expected to be profitable. Facebook reported a weakening in ad business uh, Tuesday as traffic increased in non-monetized services like messaging. Uh, Cohen also estimates Twitter revenue will uh, be 18% lower than previously expected and Spotify 30% lower. Overall, uh, Cohen estimated US ad revenue fell or will fall a total of 11% year over year in 2020. Yeah, so uh, there, there's a lot of effects on the economy uh, from shutdowns, and uh, nobody has, has really got a full handle on it, but this is one aspect of it. Uh, and Facebook putting out that guidance made a lot of people nervous because they were worried, like, well, if, if it, could Facebook go down? Because uh, the, the trouble with Facebook is they've been very carefully putting out motivations for you to use the private sections of its website, most famous being Messenger, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they haven't been monetizing those. So now that ad revenue is declining, they're not making money from the increased use of those parts of the website. Yeah, and it's, you know, you sort of go, and good, because I don't want ads in my messaging app, Facebook sure. or otherwise, but this is a company that, yeah, 2020 is going to be a weird year for, for a lot of books, uh, whether you're a huge company mm -hmm. like Facebook or a smaller business. So it's almost a wash. But if it's a trend that continues, you know, if more people just change their behavior, you know, behaviors sometimes change after repetition enough, after a, a enough of a period of time, does Facebook have to get advertising revenue 
on more of a fast track in some of these products that it it hasn't been touching or it has been very deliberate about slowly introducing to not upset the masses. And if not, do you know how does the company spin the whole? Well, revenue's down, but we're still profitable. But but it, we're not as profitable as we used to be because that just doesn't work on paper. Yeah, no, I I, I think that's it. And uh, and the good news for these companies or any of you that hold stock in them is they're still profitable. So uh, yeah. they'll probably survive. Uh, also, a uh, strange time in India. India's Flipkart paused all shopping on its website and mobile app Wednesday as India began a 21-day nationwide lockdown ordered by Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Delivery drivers from Flipkart, Amazon, and Alibaba's Big Basket all reported instances of being stopped by police. Flipkart has resumed deliveries after receiving government assurance of the safety of its delivery staff. Alibaba is working, says it's working with authorities to allow movement of big basket personnel and vehicles as well. And assemblers, Foxconn and Wistron, have suspended production at their India plants, which cover some iPhone models, in order to also comply with this lockdown. Foxconn at least says operations plan to resume April 14th. Yeah, this is uh, this is a, a difference in approach. Uh, here in Los Angeles, they, when they put in the lockdown orders, they made a big deal, Mayor Garcetti here, uh, of saying, "Look, we're not going to be running around arresting people. We just we just want you to do the right thing." Uh, yeah. In India, it seems like they took a stricter approach, and we're out there really enforcing the rules. And some of these delivery folks got caught up in that. I mean, normally you would see it as a I don't know incremental approach. You start with the honor system, and then see how people comply. Does it curb the spread? Does it actually show up in the data that it made a difference? And then if it doesn't, you go to harsher measures like, you know, stay where you're at, shelter and don't move. Uh, if that doesn't work, then you start enforcing with, with harder rules. It seems like India just jumped right to uh, part B instead of playing with A very long. Yeah, a different different style of doing this. Uh, the other thing you mentioned, Sarah, of course, Foxconn and Wistron uh, goes along with us talking about LG, Samsung, and others uh, mm -hmm. ramping down production. And uh, there was an interesting Wired article today about how the fact that the virus is shutting down in phases around the globe might actually end up working out okay. It won't be great. They weren't trying to say it was great. But uh, as China's just getting its manufacturing back in, in gear, demand is going down in places, uh, but also India manufacturing shutting down. So that demand could be enough to keep China going until the demand starts to come back in India. Like it, it might all time out to just be kind of a slow curve Slow down. We'll have to wait and see, of course. Mm -hmm. Dell now supports the ability to mirror an iPhone screen to a Dell PC using Dell's Mobile Connect app. You can control the phone's screen using mouse and keyboard, drag and drop photo and video files, not all files, Android version of this you can do a lot more with, uh, but you can drag and drop your photo and video files between the phone and the PC. And speaking of those Android users, uh, Android's Mobile Connect for Dell can now use a PC to send MMS files uh, from smartphones as well. Uh, this is really cool, and I have some experience with needing on a PC and a Mac and kind of different platforms being able to mirror iOS devices or iPad OS devices, which we'll now call those because they have their own OS. Um, and that is when I need to stream or share artwork that I'm doing, sometimes with a client. And they need to be able to see it in a, she a screen sharing way that isn't just screenshots. They want to see it while I'm zooming in, doing replays of some of it or whatever. And I use something called Reflector 3 which has been pretty good. It's not amazing. It's got its problems. Occasionally has a weird little glitch here and there, but basically mimics AirPlay um, on both platforms. And it works pretty well. Uh, and does a good job of sort of replicating everything you would normally do with that screen. Uh, it doesn't have some of these other features like drag and drop photos and video files and moving content from device to desktop, from desktop to device. That's really exciting here because I would use that stuff all the time. I use AirPlay when I can, or not AirPlay, AirDrop when I can, but that's, again, only on the Mac side. On the PC side, I'm kind of stuck and I have to use Dropbox or other slower ways uh, to sort of handle that sort of thing. So I think this is going to be a big deal for a lot of people for lots of productivity reasons, but I can tell you if you're out there and you're like, man, I want to start streaming my art on on um, Twitch or, or or YouTube and you were looking for a way to do it, this now has a built-in way to do it if you have this Dell machine. Dude, sounds like you want to get a Dell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have exactly one Windows machine, and it's a Dell laptop, and I'm so excited to just use this just so it works. And I can say, that's handy. Yeah, it's yeah. very handy. It's one of those things also, it always, this one, this feels like one of those things that 
Android people got early because it's a more open platform. It's less cracked down in terms of, you know, what Apple controls and that sort of thing. And Google's made it more open. And us iOS users are like, ah, man, there's here's one example where I'm ticked. But this is great to hear. I mean, I this this kind of usability is is huge, especially if you're a cross-platform user and you're not necessarily in the Apple universe, but you like their phone. Great way to just increase productivity when it comes to moving files around, and we're much more mobile these days. I mean, it's it's awesome. So I can't actually in your particular case, sir, I can't wait to hear how this works with your notebook once once it comes out because you'll have yeah. direct access. Yeah, to me too. Uh, I do wish it was truly cross-platform. You didn't have to have a Dell, but I've got an Alienware. Maybe I'll try it on that, too. Well, never know. They own them still, right? That's still yep. theirs. Yep. So maybe they got a little sneaky something going on in there. I mean, I'm, I'm all for this stuff just being more available in general. And like I said, Reflector 3 does a really good job of a lot of these features. But me moving a big file around, not one of them. So I, I am all for this, and I'm also really tired on the PC side of it having to think about where I want to put a very big video file or a very big, you know, some other graphic file in some sort of cloud so storage service. Find out, oh, I've already got more than three things synced from my Dropbox. This is a really cool solution. I hope it, I hope it spreads. Uh, Safari for Mac OS, speaking of uh, Mac OS, iOS and iPad OS, now blocks all third-party cookies by default. Third-party cookies are set by domains that aren't the same as the page you're visiting. This prevents cross-site frequency, or sorry, excuse me, cross-site request forgery attacks and cross-site tracking. Safari now uh, also now limits website scripts to storage for one week. The WebKit team behind the change will report results to the World Wide Web Consortium. Google, uh, Google and that is to say Chrome, plans a similar change for 2022. Uh, but some developers have noted that while blocking third-party cookies is generally a good thing, deleting all local storage after seven days hurts online apps offline offline apps offline sorry offline yeah uh particularly yeah that's the whole point uh because some some folks who develop these apps for offline use uh these web apps are saying that getting rid of that javascript storage really undermines their ability to make the app work i can't tell whether this is just because they designed the app to take advantage of that long-standing uh, storage and they could work around it, but it's going to be a pain. Uh, or if it really like fundamentally undercuts uh, the ability to do offline web apps. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd be curious if if you're a developer who's upset about this, you don't need to write in. We get that. We were seeing a lot of that. Uh, but if you're a developer who's like, yeah, I honestly, it's annoying, but I know I can still do my offline web app this way. Uh, we'd, we'd love to hear that if there's that side of it. Yeah, I I know that the complaint, at least, yes, from the developer community who's like, this actually isn't a very good thing for us, is, well, if Apple's claiming that this just makes everybody more private, then why don't apps in the App Store have to, uh, you know, adhere to the following rules? Because offline apps are at times rendered kind of dead, depending on what it does, uh, if you're if the data is getting blown out every seven days. Uh, but it's not exactly the same with with Apple's App Store. But, you know, it's it's a little bit apples and oranges, but mm -hmm. I, I feel like I understand what's what what the complaint is. But yes, I would I would love to know from a developer why this isn't always a bad thing, uh, because I, I have heard from what might be a a very vocal minority. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then this is going to happen, right? No matter what, because Chrome's going to do it, yeah. too. Uh, there's already browsers out there that do this to a certain extent, like Brave, uh, with some very minor uh, exceptions. So this is the new normal to say, look, we're just we're just not going to allow this to happen by default. It's a, it's a little surprising that that it's so such a disparity in time. 2022 versus now just seems like a big, huge chunk of time. I don't know why. I mean, I, maybe Chrome has their reasons, but I'm a little surprised that they're. Yeah, taking well, Chrome so. Chrome takes things slower uh, in general, and I think that's probably why. Uh, Safari was the first to build ad blocking at all into the browser. Uh, Chrome takes a little more time because oh, I don't know, maybe because Google uh, makes most of its money off advertising uh, to help advertisers adjust to the coming change. Sure. Maybe that's why. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Hey, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right, folks, you're hearing a lot about the bad effects. In fact, we've had a couple of them on the show already uh, of the virus. So we want to take some time each show uh, to talk about the things people are doing to try to fight 
COVID-19. We did that on yesterday's show. We're going to do it again now. Uh, the state of New York has started a COVID-19 technology SWAT team and is looking for people with experience in product management, software development, engineering, hardware deployment, end user support, data science, operations management, design, or other similar areas. If you fit this and want to help the state of New York, uh, go check out the link in our show notes, dailytechnewsshow.com, or just do a search for the COVID-19 technology SWAT team New York and uh, find out information about that. Also, volunteers from Amazon, Alphabet, Apple, MongoDB, Cloudflare, and other tech companies have been working closely with epidemiologists to launch a virus tracking website. Took them less than a week, six days. COVIDnearyou.org asks people to voluntarily share whether they have symptoms, uh, other details like, have you had the flu vaccine? Because if you haven't, maybe you just got the flu. Uh, and then add in gender, age, and zip code in order to help public health groups better understand the spread of the virus. Any data collected will only be shared with health groups, not with tech companies. Remember, these I, are volunteers did this, from the companies. I did this this morning, by the way. Oh, you did? It took, took about... 15 seconds you know oh, <laughs> what, what you mentioned wow. tom is exactly what they ask you they don't ask any more data they don't want to know your name just what your zip code is and how you're feeling and and if you've had a flu shot and and the more yeah the more the more data that can be shared very easily for a really good reason the better yeah the government I, a, I found out today my son has a what appears to be just a bad sinus cold thing um but it, when I saw this, I thought, you know what? I should have him do this because yeah. some of the data is going to be people with symptoms that have nothing to do with COVID. Right. It could be, you know, I've just know got the regular too. flu or cold. Yeah. So, yeah, really cool thing. I'm going to have well, him do it today. Especially because now is the time where people still are getting the flu. People are getting colds. It's of course. still really, yeah. I mean, not that you can't get a cold in the summer, but it's still really cold in a lot of places in the world. So, mm. you know, what I hear a lot of is my friend saying, well, my brother's got a cough. He might have coronavirus. And I'm like, he might have lots of things. Yeah, you know, man. so this is this is just a way to kind of be able to follow the general pattern of sickness that we experience every year anyway. The government yeah. of Singapore is making its Trace Together app source code freely available to developers around the world to use and modify. This has proved very effective in Singapore. Trace Together can identify people who have been within two meters of infected patients using Bluetooth. Uh, so it's basically open sourced. The World Health Organization is partnering with multiple tech companies, including Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, WeChat, Slack, Giphy, TikTok, and Pinterest for a hackathon to develop software to help fight against COVID-19. It's called Build for COVID-19. Look for that hashtag out there. Uh, accepting project submissions from Thursday through Monday, and the top projects will be announced on April 3rd. MIT researchers plan to publish open source designs for a low cost respirator on the MIT Emergency Ventilator Project or EVENT. There's a few of these going on. The motorized device uses a motor to compress widely available bag valve masks. The designs are waiting for emergency approval by the US Food and Drug Administration. Uh, and if the design does prove safe and effective, which it still needs to do, it could be used as a backstop when full ventilators run out. This isn't a replacement for ventilators, but it's an emergency measure that hospitals could use, or maybe people in remote areas that don't have access to hospitals could also use. I love that one. I love the ones where designs and, and, and open source stuff or, or, you know, projects that are being worked on in universities could get into other hands. And that means manufacturing could go up. It means people have more options in places they normally wouldn't have these options. I, that's my favorite on this list. I love that. I'm also interested when, when you talk about emergency approval by the FDA, it, because sometimes getting a drug approved or, or some sort of, you know, medical technique, there's all sorts of things where they go, ah, you know, it's years, clinical trials and the whole thing. Emergency approval obviously takes away resources from something else because it's more important to focus on this. How fast is that turnaround? Yeah, you know? I don't know. It's a it's it's a call for rapid review under an emergency use authorization. I'm sure there's a lot of things that fall under that these days. Yeah, I just I don't know enough about how that's all set up internally. Uh, it's kind of fascinated by the whole thing. We have a lot of 3D printer stuff going on. ZDNet reports uh, a lot of these Stratasys printing thousands of disposable face shields at its facilities in Minnesota, Austin, and California, and giving them to healthcare professionals for free. 
Uh, Medtronic and Dunwoody College are providing support for the materials. Uh, also posted printing and assembly instructions online with a form if you want to help join the effort in printing these. Stratasys also joined CoventChallenge.com, hosted on GrabCAD, uh, which is a group trying to develop a rapidly deployable mechanical ventilation solution similar to the one we were just talking about. HP is printing and delivering components for face masks, face shields, mask adjusters, nasal swabs, hands-free door openers, and respirator parts. HP also testing and validating designs for other applications, including a mechanical bag valve mask. A lot of people working on that. Hospital-grade face masks, and HP is taking the validated designs and posting them freely online for others to use as well. Proto Labs is pressing ventilator parts in the thousands and working with the University of Minnesota to design a new ventilator that is easier to make. Form Labs is printing COVID-19 test swabs and personal protective equipment for hospitals. They collaborated with several hospitals, including the University of South Florida and Northwell Health, and are sharing their designs. Ford is using its 3D printing factory capacity to produce plastic face shields and components of other personal protective equipment with the first batch testing at Detroit Mercy, Henry Ford Health Systems, and Detroit Medical Center's Sinai Grace Hospitals. And Smile Direct Club, which usually makes teeth straightening kits and claims to be one of the largest 3D printing manufacturers in the United States, is working with health organizations to print face shields and respirator valves, but is also making its global HIPAA-trained contact center team uh, and support system available for use. Interested health organizations should email resilience at smiledirectclub.com. Now, the, the heroes come out of unusual places a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how heroic it is, but it's awesome to see. Uh, I, as much as it, it's, it, you don't want any of this to be going on, I'm always interested to see, like in wartime, where like World War II, you'd see a company that used to make tin cans. Was it your grandpa that did this? Was it you that was telling me this? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Okay. American Can and Company. Went to make he, or whatever. Yeah, he started exactly. working for Amortorp, making torpedoes. That's just amazing. Well, to he me. was an accountant helping them account for the torpedoes. Well, stuff. it takes a it takes a village, but I just love <laughs> the idea of them shifting gears and coming up with a way to do this, and it's greater good stuff that just makes me feel a little better about everything. You know what I mean? This is great. Uh, French startup Miracle has developed, and that's M-I-R-A-K-L, by the way, has developed an e-commerce marketplace called StopCOVID19.fr to centralize supply and demand of essential products. So uh, starting with hand sanitizer, but they're going to expand to other products. It'll help companies and health organizations coordinate. So if somebody making the hand sanitizer needs a warehouse to store it in, they'll be able to find them on here. And of course, hospitals and other health organizations will be able to obtain the materials and find out who has them and where are they. Only healthcare facilities and companies making COVID-19 protection goods may participate in yeah. this particular marketplace. Yeah, it's not the people who should be getting all that hand sanitizer right. going to the right going to the right folks. Academics at Oxford's Blavatnik School of Government have launched the Oxford COVID-19 Government Response Tracker, aggregating data from 11 indicators. So they look at like, oh, is, are the schools closed in this area? Or is transport closed? What are the fiscal indicators? What's the monetary policy? And they're creating an index that compares the effect of worldwide policy responses containing data from 73 countries. It's freely available. It's meant for policymakers to understand the impacts of different state interventions so they can see what's working. Like, oh, we saw in this country that when they closed transport, it had this effect. Maybe we do or don't want to do that. And finally, IBM's The Weather Company has launched a COVID-19 mapping tool at weather.com and also in the Weather Channel mobile app, combining data from multiple sources. So Johns Hopkins, a lot of people have been using that. The WHO, as well as locally reported data from states and counties, putting it all together in an incident map. Uh, there's also an analytics dashboard that reports things like the rate of spread. This is using IBM's Watson and Cognos analytics tools. And it's being made for researchers and public officials, but it's not behind a wall. So anybody can access it if you're just curious and want to see more than just what you'd find at any one of these sites. That's very cool. I yeah, I mean, just just kind of thinking of it, you know, from a macro perspective, macro perspective, I I I try to stay up on what's going on in my immediate area for obvious reasons, but uh, this is the 
the the wave happens in different places in different ways because of different behaviors that people have and so it's you know it's a big anthropological anthropological study along with you know the 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 immediate situation that we're in yeah it's like uh you get comfortable sometimes in in where you're at like we look at new york or i look in california and i just think man it's so much worse there why is it so much worse than here and i know the i know the answers to a lot of that it's about proximity and population and everything else mm. but then stuff will happen locally and you're like no 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 wait guys that's a thing that you're doing a thing that will get us to where now they're all talking about us like we're new york or whatever so stop doing that thing and the more resources we have to have people be able to track things locally as well as nationally the more technology put into play to do that the better i absolutely love that the daily tech news show is talking about these things not just from my own <laughs> mental health to hear positivity during a time of you know so much uncertainty but it's actually just good information to know that these things are being worked on where they're being worked on what you can do to be a part of it like it's a yeah. real it's a real awesome thing tom i don't know i i, I uh, made the joke earlier today that i'm practicing social distancing with my news as well and uh, trying to focus on these actual sources of information from healthcare professionals from validated data uh, and and so some of these things are great for that, like the Weather Channel app. Uh, other things are, are things that you might be able to join in on if you have a 3D printer or if you're involved in that world. If you're an engineer and you can join that at New York City SWAT team, uh, the, it doesn't have to be just I'm looking at the news and it looks bad and I don't know what to do. There's a lot going on out there. Also going on, conversations in our Discord. Great community there. You can join the conversation by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's check out the mailbag. Oh, let's. Brooks wrote in, wanted to share a little parent hack uh, that he came up with helping his family around the house because he and his wife and his three kids are all home together. Brooks has a five-year-old girl, twin boys that are both three because they're twins. Sharing has been a real struggle, says Brooks. I'm constantly setting a timer for sharing and it was getting annoying. So I made an Amazon Echo routine that will play a sound, announce whose turn it is, and then even change one of my Philips Wiz lights to the kid's chosen color every two minutes. It's a little cumbersome to set up, but once it is, it works well. The kids had fun picking out what their sound would be, mm -hmm. and we came to an understanding of colors because all the kids wanted to have blue. Mm -hmm. I've also had luck with using the Philips Wiz and fight electric lights as an okay to wake clock for the boys and a stay on task timer for my older daughter. Ah, oh, these are these are great. Uh, my my niece, we definitely use the Amazon timer uh, on, uh, and until very recently, she was an only child. So we didn't have to deal with the sharing. So it's cool to hear about using that routine. That's super smart. Uh, and, and the light, uh, they have a, they have a smart light in her room as well that, that she can't get up in the morning until it turns a certain color, uh, or, or she doesn't or get else. To, yeah. Yeah. She, <laughs> she doesn't get something. I can't remember what it is she doesn't get, but she's very much wants that. So she, she respects the light. Uh, it's oh. good stuff. Thank you, Brooks. Yeah, totally. Andre wrote in and said, on your subject of getting together digitally, my wife's birthday is this Saturday. Happy birthday to your wife, Andre. Uh, he says, we were supposed to go out with a group of friends. So now this weekend we'll have a group supper where everyone will eat at home and have FaceTime so we can all chat together. This will be a first for most of us old folks. Take care, stay safe, don't touch your face. <laughs> Thank That's you, awesome. Andre. That's really good. Speaking of FaceTime, so every night at about, eh, not the same time, but usually around 8 or 9 o'clock, me, my three kids, we're all now out of here. We all get together on FaceTime, a group size I've never done on that app before. It works out great, actually. And we prop our phones up and we play Animal Crossing and talk to each other the whole time. Nice. Aww. Yeah, For, and great. how long does that usually go? Um, an hour, well, it's hour It's Animal and Crossing, half. so it probably takes all night. It could take all <laughs> yeah. night if you wanted, yeah. Scott's like, what do you mean how long does it take? We're doing it right now. Yeah, eventually some <laughs> people have to like get out, but uh, just for time. But yeah, it's a great way to sort of laugh and hang out and we're doing a thing we all enjoy together and it's it's been really therapeutic. It's a great thing to do. Oh, I love that. That's it's 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 really nice to hear those stories. Please keep your feedback coming. You know, it's 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 cheery for all. Also, cheery our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Chris Allen, DeGracia A. Daniels, and Ken Hayes. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson. I know you're playing a lot of Animal Crossing these days, but what else is up? Well, I have been. It's been a nice respite away from the real world. However, um, I'm busy with everything I always do, and one of those things is I put together a webcomic every week called Fred and Can. And as much as I tried it not to be this, it is kind of commentary on what's happening to us all. So if you want to see uh, what happens when Fred gets a little lazy and Can tries to explain to him why he needs to get up and move, 
well, there's some fun to be had there. Check it out at fredandcan.com. Uh, you can find everything else I do at frogpants.com. And as always, I'm on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Hey, man, during these times, uh, there are a lot of us uh, who are creators uh, trying to help make stuff to keep people entertained, keep people informed. And so I want to use this part of the end of DTNS to highlight some of the other folks out there doing good stuff today. If you ever listen or watch Good Day Internet, you know we use a tool called Showbot to let people submit titles and vote on them. That's how we pick the titles of the show. Well, if you want to support the person that makes that possible for us and a lot of other podcasts and shows, you need to go support BioCow at patreon.com slash BioCow. You can always support our show as well. Uh, this is our livelihood. Thanks to everybody who stepped up and said, look, I'm doing okay right now. I can help cover the contributions of those who can't at patreon.com slash DTNS. I mentioned we love feedback, and email is a great way to give us some feedback. Email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We also do this show live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 2030 UTC, and you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>